Welcome to another edition of Yes, We're Here. Ryan Rucco alongside my good friend and colleague, Sarah Kustak. Kus, always good to see you, my friend. Rooks, wonderful to see you and see your smiling face, that's for sure. You know, we have, um, since uh, that Nets game in LA, which you and I called uh, just before the halt of the NBA season, we've been wondering, you know, when will basketball return? And obviously, more broadly, we've been wondering, when will professional sports return? Uh, when it comes to basketball, uh, we have gotten an answer this week with the NBA agreeing to a 22-team format uh, with games scheduled to begin July 31st at Wide World of Sports Complex at Disney World. I mean, there's so many different elements, Sarah, about how they're going to make this work. But you know, just what was your overall reaction to hearing the news about the NBA coming back? Well, I, I think it's been such a series of speculations about the different proposals that I was curious just to see which one that they would land on. And I think, you know, by all accounts, I didn't have really strong opinions um, on one thing or another, but I think this looks fair. I think these are very challenging, difficult decisions um, for the league and how to best do it to make it fair. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it, enthusiastic about the, the plan that's laid ahead of us. I think more questions that will come, what we haven't yet seen are the testing protocols. We'll get those next week, hopefully. Um, but more, you know, more of the issues come with how are they going to continue to try and make sure that this is a safe environment. And I think those are still the things that we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting, right? Because it's like, I mean, there, there are just so many complications to try and get any sport back up and running because you're not only, you know, having to, um, you know, find a way to keep the competitive integrity intact so that your championship feels legitimate and it feels worthwhile, right? But you're also then, first and foremost, having to try and figure out every aspect of the health and safety, which there are just so many variables. Um, and then you're also having to figure out uh, the collective bargaining aspect, which we know how difficult, you know, those items can be. I mean, they take years to come to fruition. And in this case, you're trying to jam it into, you know, a high pressure, you know, month or, or month and a half. And, and and it's difficult to come up with. I think, you know, Sarah, the, the testing aspect will be interesting. You would think, though, you know, from a from a league standpoint, if you're restarting, then you're kind of committing to, hey, if a player gets it, unlike before, you know, you're not totally shutting down your league, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't restart because you'd be risking too much. You know, from a from a competitive standpoint, what do you think about just the idea of, hey, eight regular season games um, going to be played as sort of a runway into the playoffs and then the potential for uh, playing games uh, for that final seed, depending on where teams are at and how close they are in the standings? Well, what I love about that is the opportunity, and I know we've – heard from a variety of players throughout the course of this suspension, but just the, the concept of how do we even try to understand the position these are guys, these guys have been in to keep themselves in shape. And the only way you stay in basketball shape is playing basketball. And that is something that they've not been able to do. So a variety of different levels to how they've been able to keep themselves in shape. And then we talked about the fact that there'll be a training camp, you know, starting at the end of the month and then how they'll work their way into that. But I like the idea that there are some games to, to tune yourself up, to get yourself ready, to try and get both cohesively as a team and individuals back in a rhythm before you are tossed into playoff games. And these games mean something. You said it. I mean, there is a lot of jockeying, a lot of, I, I think there's been a lot of focus in some of those teams um, just outside the playoff picture in the Western Conference, um, but even more so, I look at the East and just maybe some of the possibility of movement there towards the middle of the conference. And so I think it, it makes it, um, you know, it exciting and, and maybe more motivating for these players, understanding the potential of what these games can bring. And you know, you, you mentioned the playing games, and I'm curious to see how that shakes out. If one of the the ninth seed, ninth seed is within four games of the eighth seed than the playoff games um, or the playing games, I should say, you have an opportunity to see. So, so I do, I like the concept of it. And I also think it, it keeps a lot of the integrity of understanding what it means, what they're playing for and what these guys are, you know, down there risking themselves for playing in Orlando. 
You know, the other thing I think too, Sarah, is like, you know, so often um, we see resistance to creativity and maybe not as much in basketball as we do in the sport of baseball, right? But, but we see resistance to it because it's like, well, you know, this is the way we've done things. We like this, you know. Um, you know, there's a certain legitimacy we feel to seasons because of this. And this is forcing everybody to step outside of their comfort zones. And so even if you just look at it from a business standpoint, right? If you're like, okay, we, we can't do this exactly as we've done in the past, but our world, our environment right now doesn't allow us that luxury. So what are we going to do? Are we going to do nothing? You know, are we going to just sit home and bag it and, and not have a season at all? Or are we going to say like, all right, yeah, there are going to be some wrinkles. There are going to be some tweaks. This is going to be a little different than before, but we're still going to bring you the sport, uh, which everybody is clamoring for. And we will bring it in a way that, you know, most closely approximates what we have done in the past as far as the competition and the legitimacy goes. And to me, overall, even though, yeah, there's some, you know, there's some things that feel different to this, I think within the confines that the league is working with, it feels like the NBA has come up with the best possible scenario along those lines. I think so. I, I, I really do think they did. I think, you know, the concept and the idea of what you're talking about of what we'll be able to see the presentation certainly will be different we know the idea that there there's not the travel um the amount of games that we'll be seeing in the course of you know each day the fact that there could be up to seven games within a day that you know in, in some of these eight games i think each team is expected to play at least one back-to-back -back. we may see back-to-back -back four teams in that first round but overall the concept of once the the top 16 teams or the top eight in the east and the top eight in the West are ready, the, the playoffs are going to be seen as we know it. And, you know, we know there's so many levels to the challenges that each team will face and how they will go about this. And that's why I think, you know, when we look at crowning an NBA champion, the amount of mental and emotional and physical challenge it will take to grind through and get to that point to me still exists. It still is there. Um, therefore, I think, you know, for all of these teams, what's ahead for them is very much often like what we anticipate, what we expect, and um, the, the amount of beauty that comes within the course of the NBA playoffs. Totally agree with your point about, like, by the time you get to a champion, you know, I mean, when you're restarting and you've had this irregular break, there could totally be that, like, sort of, like, tiptoeing into the water, like, is this real? Like, you know, at the beginning, if you will. And, but by the time you've got, you've seen these teams competing – and you go through all the levels of the playoffs and that you're going to understand that accomplishment still completely exists by the time you get to a title. I think the other interesting part of this, Sarah, is how it affects next year. You know, as the schedule is, is laid out, you are going to have this season potentially end sometime the second week of October. And then the next NBA season start December 1st, you know, which, you know, the NBA has flirted with the idea in the past or at least been, you know, there have been certain people who have had ideas about starting the season in December rather than October, but um, it'll be interesting how quick the turnaround is going to be from this season to next. Yeah, and I do think there, there may be some negotiations with the union. I think Michelle Roberts, the executive director of the NBA PA, came out and said that that looked a little quick for her. So I think these are tentative dates that we're looking at, of whether it's with the, the draft lottery, the draft, the start of free agency, when training camps will start, the proximity that comes with the expected end of the 1920 season. Um, and, you know, that December 1st date that's put, been put out by the 2021 season, um, you know, giving an opportunity for many athletes uh, to compete that in the Olympics in 2021. However, I think a lot of that, it is important to say tentative because I think those things with all of this, as we continue to go along, will be very fluid, um, you know, as the weeks pass, as the month, months pass, just as, you know, these past few weeks have been of the suspension. All right, so we'll see what happens as far as the calendar goes, Sarah, and, and next season. Uh, but, you know, I think the biggest question for Nets fans, and obviously, you know, we have plenty of Nets on Yes uh, viewers, is, you know, is there a chance with this format that the Nets get Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving on the floor? Uh, there are so many um, different aspects to the cases that can be made on both sides, and there's plenty of information that is maybe known internally but hasn't been shared. But, but Sarah, just what's your general approach to that big question about whether or not KD and Kyrie will be on the floor for the playoffs uh, once this tournament happens in Orlando? Am I allowed to say I have no idea? Because yeah, you can say it. 
I have as good of a opinion, guess, speculation, expectation as anyone, and that's, we don't know. And um, by all accounts, the, the message has been from the Nets organization and from what we've heard that it is not likely that Kevin Durant will play. And I think that, you know, that is probably the most likely possibility. But as we understand just the course of the timetable of training camp, getting back the fact that we are talking about these, this news at the beginning of June, and games are slated to start in nearly two months. I think there's always room for anything to ever change. But um, from my perspective now, I think the, the expectation is likely he will not, likely Kyrie will not. We don't know. And I think there's so much that goes into that decision that for anyone or, or any of us or any outsiders to have such strong opinions or thoughts or what we think, what we think doesn't matter, nor should it matter, um, because it's about what is best for Kevin Durant, what is best for Kyrie Irving. Um, and I believe that the organization will, um, along with medical medical officials and personnel and also Kevin themselves, Kyrie themselves, they'll make those type of decisions that is best for those individuals. And that's all that matters. Um, so I'll, I'll circle back to the, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily think so, but, but I don't know. And I don't think any of us really know other than Kevin and Kyrie themselves. And, and you know, one other aspect of this, Sarah, which I, you know, I've brought up before, um, but I do think it's relevant again is, you know, we all assume like, oh, more time has gone by, so these guys should be healthy. But, you know, their rehab processes have been totally altered because of what's gone on. You know, I mean, certain access to facilities, medical personnel, training staff, that all expedites your ability to get back on the floor just taken away or significantly reduced. So even though the time has been greater, the actual access could be, and I don't know this, but it could be significantly less. So as much as we look at it and say, wow, they've had even more time to recover, it could also be like, but yes, they've had even less resources to recover with, and that could be a, a factor as well. Now, the other interesting thing, um, Sarah, is just, you know, we saw, uh, you know, the Nets came off a big win against the Lakers, right? And we saw sort of, um, I think, a hunger and a tenacity the last couple of games before everything shut down. I mean, we had Chris Chioza all of a sudden running the offense beautifully, um, and Jock Vaughn just getting a couple of games of experience as the interim head coach uh, with the Nets, but obviously he is the man in charge uh, when this thing uh, reboots. Um, are there any things that you were able to discern from that very small sample size or just from getting to know Jock that you think we can expect from the Nets, their style of play, and being led by Jock Vaughn? Well, I, I think it was a small sample size, to your point, that he took over two games prior to that suspension. Um, you know, we know Jacques, we're around him, we understand his relationship, his connection with the players, with that entire coaching staff in general, um, the, the respect that I have for him. And I think we're going to continue to see, you know, the way that he connects, the enthusiasm, the passion, the care that he has. Um, for for the game and for his players and I think you know there, there were small tweaks that we started to see whether it was inserting DeAndre Jordan in the starting lineup in, in place of Jared Allen whether it was maybe more switching defensively some schematic things that we started to see and I, I think that returns back to the to the circle of the questions of how does that change how does this suspension change that um, has that given more time to the approach now? And I think just the idea that there's been so much uncertainty about the return of the season, what it would look like. Um, I, I think a lot of those things will still, you know, yet to be told until we actually see them step on the floor. And I just want us all to, you know, think about how we normally think about the off season, about preseason, about training camp, how long it sometimes takes for a team to, to re-gel and get back in rhythm with one another, regardless of how well they know each other, been playing with each other. These guys haven't had the ability to even be together, to play pickup games, to get runs and go five on five. A lot of stuff that normally you're able do, to do throughout the course of the off season. So that's why I think any type of expectations um, you need to temper because it's still going to be a work in progress of how you see things fitting into place, how guys come back, um, and just where they're at in course in the course of how they're preparing themselves for eight games until a potential playoff run. Well, Sarah, we can't wait to see the Nets back on the floor and here on Yes. Uh, we can't wait to see the NBA back. And it's so good to uh, catch up with you on some good news for the league. 
and um, we shall see how it develops over the next couple of months. But can't wait to see basketball and have uh, you and I calling it again sometime soon, Sarah. I'll be ready. Thanks, Ricks.